Hello, I'm going to be talking about bomb calorimetry and giving you some insight into the calculations that you're going to do, as well as some of the theoretical backing behind uh, why the calculations are set up the way that they are. Cool, so bomb calorimetry. First of all, the thing that bomb calorimetry measures is the heat of combustion. Um, so it's this steel bomb. I'm at home, so don't have it here. Anyway, imagine this is a steel bomb. Um, you put your sample inside, and so all the heat, uh, so you detonate it in the presence of oxygen, and the heat that comes from that reaction, um, so the example I have here is methane, although that's a gas, but it just makes the stoichiometry easier. Um, so if we were to combust methane in a bomb calorimeter, um, so what would happen is in the presence of oxygen, uh, a combustion occurs and it yields CO2 and H2O. Um, side note, make sure that your uh, reactions are balanced. You'll have to do that. Um, so the thing to think about with delta H of combustion, that this is the heat that's given off um, in the combustion reaction. So here you've got your bomb, you've got your little sample inside, and it is encased within a calorimeter that's filled with water. You measure the temperature change here. Um, and so as you detonate this, the heat energy is going to come out and it's going to be absorbed by the calorimeter, but then some heat is going to continue on that's not absorbed by the calorimeter and it's going to go to the water, heating up the water. This heat energy comes from what? The breaking of the bonds or the forming of the bonds? Your answer should be both. Uh, because what you're doing is you're looking at Hess's law and Hess's law looks at the um, difference between the forming of the bonds giving off energy and the breaking of the bonds it takes energy takes energy to break a bond tattoo it on your forehead to show your chemistry pride um, but make sure you do it backwards so when people read it or you know and, and or, so when you're looking in the mirror you can read it the right way anyway bad joke whatever so, um, so when you break the bonds here, it takes energy. When they form here, CO2 and H2O are much more stable um, than the com combination of these two. So heat energy is given off. When heat energy is given off, what's the sign that we use? Think about a bank account. When you, money goes out of the bank account, bank account goes negative. When money comes into the bank account, bank account goes positive. So the heat of combustion should be a negative value. So delta H is going to be less than zero for an exothermic process. Okay. Um, right. So quick reminder of Hess's law. So delta H of a reaction is equal to the summation of delta H of formation of the products mine and actually should, there should be uh, times the number of moles of each of the products minus delta uh, H formation of the reactants multiplied by the number of moles that you have. Um, so this is when um, uh, energy is um, uh, given off from the product size. So this is the formation of the bonds. You're subtracting that then from the um, energy that it takes to break the bonds for the reaction. Um, and so each of these, the heat of formations, are going to be from your um, natural state compounds. So the heat of um, formation reaction for CO2 is going to be uh, carbon plus oxygen yields CO2. Okay. So delta H of formation. Cool? Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second. So here's my calorimeter again. Um, and so we want to know what is the heat absorbed by my calorimeter. On each bomb, there will be a, a number, a serial number. Um, so you need to make sure that you use the same one. Think about why. Um, and so uh, you'll be finding the heat absorbed by your specific calorimeter. And you will be relating that to this relationship. Delta U is equal to CV delta T. Now delta U, that is, um, pause. 
Sorry, just got a text from the nanny, so I had to pause. Um, okay, delta U is equal to CV delta T. This is actually Q equals MC delta T in disguise. Um, and so uh, this is heat. Typically, when you saw this in Chem 116, we didn't classify what kind of heat this was. There are two types. Well, there are many types of heat. Um, but the way that we, as chemists, quantify uh, heat, it's either as the internal energy, U, or the enthalpy, which is H. So U is internal energy, and H is your enthalpy. Very specific distinctions. For those of you who have CAD Chem 370 uh, thermodynamics, great, go into it. Um, for those of you who have not, you have something to look forward to if you plan to take it. Um, but uh, briefly, the way that you can relate the two, H is equal to U plus P V. Internal energy, if you think back to when you represent electronic states like this, and you got your little electrons here, um, and these little lines represent an energy. I'll move my fake calorimeter out of the way. Um, although it's a great insulator, absorbs a lot of heat. And Tennessee, that's cool. Okay. These energies represent the quantum states of those electronic energy levels. Then you've got the bonds. There's going to be energies associated with those. They're nuclei. There's energy associated with the nuclei. We lump all of those together and say, okay, that's all the energy that's internal to the molecule itself. Okay. Um, and in order to calculate it directly, you need statistical thermodynamics and other things. But um, you can all clump it in together and say, okay, that's the internal energy, energy internal to that particular molecule. When you add to it PV, pressure times volume, if you think back to your physics course, if you've had it, um, that's pressure volume work. Okay, so PV work, pressure volume. So if you um, do the units of this, um, pressure is a force per unit area. You've got uh, volume is an area times an area, ah, an area, sorry, times a length. Areas cancel, so now you've got force times a length. Force cross a distance, that's work. Cool? So PV, this is the work done by the system or on the system depending. But anyway, so this is the work that's capable of being done in addition to the internal energy. So if I'm a molecule, I've got my internal energy, I'm jiggling about, but then if I then expand and if I move this direction or if I cause um, some sort of force per unit area pressure, pressing against um, the walls of a container, I'm adding work now to the system, that is my enthalpy. Okay, internal energy plus the work that one can do. Cool, okay. That was a little longer side story, but I wanted you to see the differences there. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say at constant volume, Q equals U or delta U, I should say. Delta U is a state function. That means we only care about the initial and the final states of the system. We don't care about what happens in between. Um, okay, so if that's the case, I've got delta U is equal to, and I'm going to lump all of this together into CV. This is the heat capacity of my calorimeter. Okay. So you'll find that the, the calorimeter itself is a huge honking beast. It's big um, and it's very heavy. It's stainless steel. And so, and we don't know the molecular structure of it necessarily. And we don't know um, the mass of it. We just know that it, the whole thing is going to absorb a certain amount of energy. And that whole thing involves the lid. It involves the gaskets in the top. It involves the electrical leads. So we just lump it all in and say, okay, there's this chunk of metal the calorimeter that's going to absorb this certain amount of energy. Um, so we just label that as CV. And then we've got delta T. Cool? Okay. So now what we need to do is we need to figure out how much energy is absorbed by the calorimeter. Actually, I'm going to pause for a second. Let's go back to our main question, um, which is the, the overall question of the lab, is what's the delta H of formation of some compound, okay? 
And so in order to get to the delta H of formation, we need to relate that to, it says relate to the delta H of combustion. Cool, okay, but delta H of combustion needs to now be related to delta U of combustion. So the way that we do that, I'm gonna erase all of this. Delta H is equal to delta U plus delta PB. And what I've done is I've just looked at the definition of enthalpy is equal to U plus PV. And I wanna look at the change of the enthalpy. So the products enthalpy minus the reactants enthalpy. Um, and so that means delta U plus delta PV. Okay, but we're going to assume the ideal gas law here. So when I have my compound of choice plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O, whatever my compound is that combusts in the presence of oxygen, gas phase, yields CO2, gas phase, plus H2O, liquid phase. People forget that. Whatever those stoichiometric coefficients are, make sure you balance them again. You might forget. Um, and anyway, so what you're doing is you're looking at Upon combustion, you're gonna have the creation of CO2 and H2O. There's an additional expansion that occurs from the creation, well, after you create the CO2 from your reactants, then there's an expansion that occurs. We're assuming that the expansion of that gas is gonna behave ideally, okay? So if that's the case, what do you know about PV equaling to something else? NRT. Glorious. So I say delta H is equal to delta U plus delta NRT. But, and this is cool, we are going to assume that our temperature is constant at a particular case, okay? So this equals then delta U plus, and R is a constant, so both of these can come out, RT times delta N. And this is specifically delta N of the gas. All right. So this is how we relate delta U of combustion to our delta H of combustion. We relate it by adding on the additional thermal energy, RT, times the number of moles of gas that change from the O2 to the CO2. Products minus reactants gives you your delta N. So if this was three and this is two, say, I don't know, um, then this number would be three minus two, so this would just be one. Or if this was three and this was two, your delta N, yes, in fact, would be negative, which means you would be subtracting off now an RT delta N gas. Awesome? Okay, now I'm gonna talk about uh, how we can make this assumption of T is constant. Okay. So I'm hoping that you're going to be watching this video as you read through the lab handout, um, just because uh, you're going to read through the lab handout probably a couple of times, and hopefully this will supplement some of the connections between the equations. All right, so we have our sample, and we are at about 30 atmospheres. That is ridiculous. That is like crazy high pressure. Um, lots and lots of pressure. Okay, so we've got P1. So this is our initial pressure. We've got a volume one, and we've got a temperature one. The combustion reaction occurs, so these are our reactants, and then we get a second pressure two, volume two, and a temperature two. And this is our products. And we're going to go back to square plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. Again, fill in the blank with whatever it is that you're combusting. Okay, so we're changing the number of moles of gas on each side in some cases. And if that's the case, you're also changing the type of moles what well, they are. Um, but we're assuming ideal. So if you have two moles of this and two moles of this, there shouldn't be any difference in the pressure. But there will be a difference um, for our particular reactions. So our initial pressure and our final pressure will be different. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to say, so we're going from reactants to products. So I can say, okay, so we're going to have one change. P1 and P2 are going to change. What about volume? 
stainless steel, very large, heavy bomb. Do you think CV changes? Or sorry, do you think the volume changes? No. So this one is going to be the same. And so this um, supports CV, which is constant volume process. Okay, so there's heat that's exchanged when the pressure changes. There's heat that's exchanged when the volume changes, but the volume doesn't change, so we're good there. There's also heat that's exchanged when the temperature changes. Go team. Do you recall that I told you that we were using state functions? Q under constant volume is equal to delta U. This is a state function. Yay, what does that mean? Well, you might say, well, it means it's path independent. It doesn't matter the path we follow. Yes, the reason now, so and how do we use that? Well, we wanna get from reactants to products. Well, if I'm gonna get from here to here, I can add together this process plus this process. Glorious. So I'm gonna break this down into two steps, one at constant pressure and one at constant temperature, and then we're gonna add those together. Okay, so another way to look at this, and this is from the diagram that's in the um, handout, is we've got, uh, so pressure one and temperature one, and then we've got pressure one and temperature, oops, sorry, pressure two and temperature one, and then we've got uh, pressure two and temperature two. Okay, so we wanna go that route where I've got P1, T1, so this would be those two, to P2 and T2. So instead of that, I'm gonna now, and this would just be our delta U of combustion. Cool. But instead of going straight there, which would be going along this path, I now wanna go, okay, I'm gonna do change pressure first, and then I'm gonna change from T1 to T2, okay? So I've got a delta P here, delta T equals zero, and I've got a delta T here and a delta, oops, delta P equals zero. Okay, so I've switched it. So now pressure changes, temperature changes. Okay, so here to go from pressure changing and temperature staying the same, we're going to say this is delta U at T1, because notice T1 stays the same. All right, now we've got over here, I've got delta U is equal to a change in temperature. Well, if delta U depends on temperature and temperature's changing, that means now that I have to take into account the heat capacity. And that actually occurs via the integral of CV dt from T1 to T2 but because there is no, we're assuming that there's no temperature dependence of the heat capacity, this can be pulled out of the integrand if you remember your calculus. And so that equals just CV delta T or CV times T evaluated at T1 and T2, which is equal to CV T2 minus T1, which gives you CV delta T. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. Um, good so far? Hopefully. Okay, so from here I've got delta U is equal to CV delta T. Awesome. So if I take this plus this, these two paths, add them together, I should get this path. So delta U T1 plus delta U um, from the, how do I label it? I don't have that labeled at all, um, is equal to delta U of combustion. Glorious. Okay, one more thing. This system, we are assuming it is going to occur under an adiabatic process. What that means is no heat is lost to the surroundings. So if you classify your system as the big beige container thing that's got the lid on it, all of the heat exchange that's happening is happening inside the system. So if that's the case, that means nothing is escaping to the outside, no heat loss. If no heat is lost, 
first law of thermodynamics holds, which is awesome. It says that the internal energy of a uh, isolated system is constant. So if this system is isolated, so delta U, an isolated system is constant, or actually is zero, which means that the U is constant. This is conservation of energy. If that's the case, that means this thing is equal to zero. Cool. So if I've got delta UTI plus delta U is equal to delta U of combustion, that's equal to zero. So now I've got delta UTI plus delta U equals zero. What does that mean these two are related by? And I've got delta U T1, I keep saying TI, sorry about that, T1, is equal to delta U with a negative sign. Cool? Again, these are supplements to the lab handout. You should be reading the lab handout first. This will help clarify the lab handout, and then we'll be good to go. Okay, I'm going to pause and erase. Okay, so now we've got delta U of combustion is equal to zero. Um, because it's an adiabatic process, delta U T1 is equal to minus delta U, and this should be from inside the calorimeter, okay? But inside the calorimeter, we have um, two different compounds present. I'm just going to double check. Yeah, okay, so delta U of our sample plus delta U of our wire. I won't go into it. You should read the handout and think about what you're doing um, when, you're, when you're assembling the bomb. Okay, so these two things are gonna be added together. And so delta U then is equal to this with a negative sign, All right? And so if we want to find, so the goal is to find Actually, I'll write this over here. One, find CV from known delta H of combustion. So we know our delta H of combustion. This will be of benzoic acid. So from there, delta H of combustion of benzoic acid is equal to delta U of combustion of benzoic acid plus RT delta N. I'm going to say approximately because we are assuming an ideal gas law. Then from here, you know what delta U of combustion is. So now we know that CV is equal to delta U sample plus delta U wire with a negative sign divided by delta T. Look at the connection between these. Delta U of our combustion is zero, which means we can then relate delta U that occurs at the single temperature single temperature, single temperature. You can't make this step from delta H of combustion is delta U of combustion plus RT delta N unless T is constant. Go team. So that's why we need to have this relationship of delta U T1. I keep saying TI. Um, T initial, same thing. Okay. Um, so because this happens at constant temperature, now you can use this relationship, which is why we need to relate this back to now it's happening internal to the system. Okay. That's your delta U of the sample. That's your delta U of the wire. Um, and then this is the one that you're after, which is cool. So you find this goal. And then once you have your CV, the heat capacity of the calorimeter, doesn't change. It doesn't matter if I put tea or coffee in here, it's going to absorb the same amount of heat. Doesn't matter the sample, the calorimeter will remain the same calorimeter. Assuming you use the same one. I had some students years back use a different one and they were like, I don't understand why I have 45% error. Let me tell you, use the same calorimeter. Your heat capacity was different. Okay, um, so once you find CV, of your benzoic acid. Now do the reverse. So now you have CV is known. You have your delta T. That gives you your delta U. Awesome. Well, but you know that your delta U 
has both a sample sample plus the delta u of the wire and so then when you have your delta u of the sample you need to understand what your change of moles are take into account uh, rt your thermal energy add it to your delta u and now you get your delta h of the combustion reaction Don't forget, now you need to apply Hess's law because you're going to be trying to identify the delta H, um, or sorry, the heat of formation of one of your compounds. Okay, I think I've covered it all. Internal energy is a state function. We can break it up into two parts. We need two parts because one of them happens at constant T, and you can't determine delta H of combustion without assuming this constant T, um, as well as we need to know the uh, delta U of the wire that's given off, and there's this arbitrary negative sign that's not arbitrary because our system is adiabatic. Cool? I think that's all I have. Um, if you have questions, uh, please let me know. Um, cool. Bye. <laughs>